this is hopefully, hopefully, hopefully in your notes from the last class. So going back to Thursday's class, which we talked about here, a kind of framing device for the this first chapter that we read in the textbook, as well as a framing device for what cultural anthropology sought to be or was situated in as an enterprise, as an academic enterprise. And so what I was talking about in the last class is that there are some issues that there's, they still structure our lives today. They haven't exactly, they haven't at all gone away. They may be, there's maybe different permutations of them. There may be different ideas. There may be some different answers to them. There may be some people who've given up on these questions or some people that are starting to, to wonder why we always frame these questions in the context of, of the West. And so these things are changing, but they still actually very much influence our lives. The idea of, you know, how to treat other people and if everybody deserves to be human, if everyone is in some ways the same as a human being. Um, what accounts for human behavior? Is it because of something out there in, in the natural world or in our biology or from what? And are we, are, we, are we going, are we on our way to a much better world or are we on our way to a much worst world? What, where, what is the direction of humanity? And uh, we talked about how in the, in the old, old days, uh, these questions were mostly per, mostly um, undertaken from a philosophical or a theological perspective. People would, would read the Bible or, or, or other sacred texts and try to find the answers to these, or they'd, they'd try to do it within the confines of their own mind. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, especially since, uh, since the, the ideas of, of Darwin and others uh, a lot of these questions got put into the sciences, into uh, evolution, into biology, rather than into, uh, into the theological or the philosophical part of, part of the world. And what I was proposing, and we'll read about this in the next chapter, in chapter two of our textbook, which we'll read for Thursday on research methods, is that anthropology kind of styled themselves as the people who went out and found the answers by, by doing field work and by looking around at different populations. So the idea that anthropology was the, the science, I, I guess in the old days we would have called it the science of man. And we may as well use that idea of the science of man because it's coming up to us when we talk about Darwin. Darwin, Darwin, Darwin. Ah, uh, yeah. So then we talked about this part, which is also hopefully in your notes, which is to say that all these philosophical, these big theological questions and, and eventually evolutionary questions were part of a context in which we had an expansion of certain people, certain powers, uh, especially out of Europe, and setting up a, a kind of uh, a global network, which was for the most part uh, led by uh, the European and later North American powers. And so all of the questions that we have about are people human, is the world getting better? Always, always, always we have to think about the context of race because that was also being born at this time, people starting to classify other organisms into groups and to ascribe uh, ascribe various characteristics to those groups, which were said to determine their behavior. And so I put up this quote, this is uh, from Darwin's journals, and one probably should not always steal from somebody's journals, but this was were kind of his thoughts about uh, the people in the Tierra del Fuego, also called the Fuegians, uh, in, in what is now uh, the south of Argentina, and what we might call a hunter-gatherer type group. And, you know, we, he kind of spelled out all the things that they didn't have or all the things that, that in which they compared to, uh, to what he thought of as his own society. 
And so, uh, Leah, we uh, read a little bit that you had a great quote from Augustine Fuentes on this, which kind of encapsulated what Darwin was feeling about other people and he expressed in dissent. How did this, how did this get encapsulated in a more sort of succinct form than this? Well, well the quote pretty much said that he believed that um, he didn't think people of merit in Australia Okay, so yeah, I mean, this is again, we sort of spelled it out here, but we had a sort of condensed version of it in Fuentes where he said, you know, he didn't think of highly of indigenous people in the Americas, uh, indigenous people to the Australias, and probably in some ways, especially. Uh, in Africa, because we probably should should note here that a lot of the race stuff is not just about race, but about anti-blackness and the kind of uh, extreme uh, ideas that that has has influenced in in our society. So um, we see this uh, in this piece on Fuentes. We'll get to that in a second. So these were the kind of some of the framing questions that I wanted to propose at the beginning of things and. Uh, then my idea was that I was going to assign you a piece from uh, Michelle Rolf Trujillo called Anthropology in the Savage Slot, which I used to give to students to read. I gave it to them about five years ago. And uh, so then, but I, then I started to read it and, and Trujillo was a, a mentor of mine. He was one of my professors at Hopkins, uh, sadly passed away uh, earlier than, than should have been. But, um, you know, I started to read it and I started to read lines like this one and it was impossible for me to, to make sense of it. It was brilliant, but there were so many references to things that even I, I hadn't heard of Condorcet. I don't even know how I'd explain how we got from Condorcet to Kant and from Hegel to Marx. So he's a brilliant, the, his, his work brilliantly frames this, but we're going to have to somehow uh, recapture it or rework it. I want to focus here, though, the reason I'm pulling up this, this bigger and extremely complicated quote to give you a sense of what you missed out on is that I want to focus here on the middle, that little middle part of his, his sentence. And uh, Rolf was the kind of person, or Trio was the kind of person who had these kind of offhand remarks in the middle, which would nevertheless be a, a brilliant observation. And the middle part is, as teleology replaces eschatology. Again, some huge words here that we don't know what he's talking about, but let me tell you what that I think means and why it is brilliant. Eschatology is uh, the idea in the, especially among biblical scholars of the study of the end times as they are related to uh, biblical uh, ideas. So uh, when we talk about eschatology, we're talking about that stuff that happens in the book of Revelations, the end of the world, the coming of the kingdom of God, you know, the judgment of people, all the things that were supposed to happen at, <laughs> maybe they're happening, at the end of the ages, right? When, when, uh, when humanity comes, her, humanity, or the earth comes to an end and, and the, the, the world of heaven and hell and if your Catholic purgatory begins, um, those things are these religious questions of eschatology. And in many of these ideas, right, the, 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 the manifestation of this is because humanity is guided by God's will and God's plan. And so the things that we do are all part of a plan which is basically controlling the destiny of our lives and of the world. Teleology is the idea that history or humanity or any sort of uh, mechanism is working in a similarly deterministic way. That our lives are, are perhaps determined by our biology or, by some, or, or that history has an end point which we are all moving to. And so this is what I said when I said that the idea of progress in evolution for or the idea of progress got taken out of the context of 
of, of creationism and the idea that God was controlling and put into the context of evolution and that natural selection produced this progress. And so what Trio is saying here is that a lot of those old ideas, those old eschatological ideas or biblical ideas were simply taken on board by uh, this new uh, idea about evolution. And you sort of took God out of the picture, but you replaced it with things like nature, biology, later on genetics. And so in these models, what we do as human beings in our lifetime really doesn't matter that much because the world is on a track. We're going somewhere. Some people believe we're going somewhere good and some people said we were going somewhere bad, but what we do is not that influential. And so that's the notion of teleology. And so you'll notice that a lot of times, you know, there's these huge fights between creationists and evolutionists. But the thing is, in terms of what they're fighting about, they often are, are in some ways very similar in that they both have this kind of religious dogma effect that you, know, you have to accept. And they both become very sort of theocratic and, and cult-like, which is perhaps why there was such a reaction to uh, Fuente's uh, piece there. So uh, again, what happens here is we have all these sort of theological or philosophical issues that get, then get, uh, get put into the ideas of evolution and nature. And so turning back to the idea of what anthropology is, so in the last class we talked about anthropology as going out into the field and doing that empirical or field-driven research to try and come up with, you know, sort of research-based answers to these questions. But I also wanted to emphasize here that anthropology, at least a lot of anthropology, has tried to provide a non-deterministic answer to these questions. So in the old days, we believed that things were determined by God, and then that became replaced by nature or by race. And what anthropology has tried to do is to turn our attention to our culture, our social institutions, our learned behavior, and get us to understand that our societies are actually creations of us. And there are creations, and people do things in all kinds of different ways, which means that we could do things in different ways too. And so since we created these social institutions, they are not unchangeable. They are not outside the scope of human change. We could think about them and we could say, hey, maybe it's not right that people are impoverished. Maybe we can do something about that. Maybe we don't just have to sit back and say that's God's will or that's the way, uh, the way race goes in this country. And so the idea from anthropology at least at least when in our more optimistic moments, as you look around at different societies and you say, hey, wait a second, people do things in all kinds of different ways. Maybe we can too, or maybe people can change. And so, uh, you know, it's not to say that anthropologists would say, oh, we are in control of our own destiny. Of course, things are gonna happen that are outside of human control, but we don't want to fall into this trap that we have no influence, that human behavior has that human activity has no chance of solving uh, some of the issues that we can identify and face. And so again, this is, these are sort of framing devices for how we want to look at when we start to think about these anthropological field studies and our ideas that we've uh, come up with from looking at other societies and looking at our own society too. With that, I wanna to turn to what I hope is uh, a non-deterministic approach to primatology and evolution and a different way of looking at some of these issues than many people in the world are used to. So let me put it to you in sort of uh, first in kind of the old way we used to look at, say, uh, the deterministic models 
of primate, non-human primate to human primate evolution would be, you just look at what the chimpanzees are doing. And if the chimpanzees are doing something, somebody's gonna be like, aha, there it is. That's where we got violence from. I just saw a chimpanzee beat another one up. So that must mean that violence is innate in human evolution. So we had one model, the chimpanzee, and we had you know, this idea that things just sort of uh, stayed with us all the time and were determined by that idea. And so uh, this was kind of, uh, it, it leads to some weird thinking, I have to say. So today we are talking about a, a, what I, I'm hoping to be a non-deterministic way to talk about the evolution of fathering or being a dad or, you know, whatever that means. So the first thing that is interesting about this article is, well, Liz, what do we know about dads, fathers, fathering, parent, fathering, and most species? Most species don't do anything. So there are some exceptions, the fish, some fish, and I don't know, ducks. Um, you know, but for the most part, the, the dads, fathers, whatever we want to call them, dads is such a weird word. Uh, they're not around, and including what about our, our friends, the apes? Most apes keep going with us. Do most apes do this? There's a few exceptions, but let's be clear that most. Ape species don't do this either. So, you know, our, our, our old friends, the chimpanzees, don't do much. I actually feel like the bonobos do more. I feel like I learned that somewhere, but you know, we'll just, we'll just let it, we'll let it go for now. Uh, somebody, somebody knows more about the bonobos than me. I thought that the males were like playful with, with children too in the bonobos, but maybe that's in zoos. Um, so there are some species that do do this, but they're, they're rare. I mean, some primate species. So uh, the article mentions the macaques and the macaques are a species of monkey. The macaques are, are really interesting. Actually, Augustine Fuentes uh, got his, his fame studying macaques because macaques are, are actually a lot of times urban monkeys. They live in cities in, uh, throughout uh, much of Southeast Asia. And so unlike other species of primates that are, are endangered, uh, macaques actually seem to be in some ways expanding or are, I mean, it's not that they're, they're happy, but they, they seem to be uh, thriving, kind of like other species that interact well with humans like deer, right? And deer don't seem to be uh, in any danger of going away. Um, so macaques are, have this characteristic as well. But then there's, there's these, these primates. Who are these, Jalen? <laughs> what kind of primates are we talking about here? Mountain gorillas. All right, so here we have mountain gorillas. And what's interesting, I guess I wanna pause here for a second on that part of it. There's mountain gorillas, there's at least two groups of gorillas. We'll just say there's two for now. I think there might be more, but let's go with two. There's mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas. And they're the same species, but they live obviously in different habitats. They have different diets and one of them, the mountain gorillas, do this males hang out with their with a bunch with kids a lot. And the lowland gorillas don't seem to do that because we're focusing here on the mountain gorillas. So let me pause for a second here. What does it tell us that within the same species? Yes, uh, Leah. It's nurture, not nature. Why do you conclude that? 
they are listening to issues just in different areas. That means that they're kind of they have to be fit like their own culture in a way. So they're good enough and have the male student and not have the female student to tell the teacher how I'm doing that. It's just really <sighs> It does seem to us like something like we might call culture. Now we don't, you know, people get people get all nervous when we talk about different guerrilla cultures. But you know, I mean, it's hard for me not to use that kind of a word because we have the same species in different areas, and if they we bring them together, they can interbreed and they look like gorillas, but they do different things. And actually, this is. I, I, I'm not, I, I shouldn't, I'm happy to use the word culture because we see the same thing with different groups of chimpanzees. Some of them hunt, some of them don't hunt so much. Some of them go to war with each other. Some of them don't. These, it's not unusual to see different, different groups of the same species behaving in a somewhat different way. So for me, the question of, well, how did dads evolve is kind of weird because, you know, it's like, well, we have the, what are seem to be the biologically similar species, but they're doing different things. I also mentioned that, you know, we used to think a lot about the gorillas as like, we used to think they were, they're so cool and they're so nice and they're so vegetarian. And uh, we used to think about them as, as kind of uh, a good model of uh, human, of, of sort of being close to humans. A number of you had a questions about which species are closest to humans. Lately, the gorillas have kind of, it's not that we don't like the gorillas anymore, but we don't think they're as close to humans as bonobos and chimpanzees. We think they diverge from the evolutionary line earlier, but I always kind of feel sad for them because there they are, they look pretty, you know, they're, they're pretty cool. Anyway, so, how do we explain, if we, this article goes into some, some, if we wanted to explain this evolutionarily, Annie, what happens, why do these males chill out with kids so much? At least what's one possibility? Um, Very sexy. So the idea is that, the, I'm having trouble with this one. This one just, it just, it just makes me laugh because I'm, I'm just trying to fix, I mean, I guess I can think about it like rationally. I guess I believe it, but I don't believe it at the same time. I don't know if any of else you are having this problem. It's like, okay, well, if I hang out with these kids, then later on, I have more reproductive success. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like if that were true, does, do people believe this? Like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, tell me, uh, am I crazy here? Does this work? I just feel like I'd see more young guys carrying babies around. I just, I don't know. I just, I, I felt like if this worked, I guess, I guess it's not, okay. I think we should separate. <laughs> I think we should separate being sexy from reproductive success. First of all, I think most of the things we do to be sexy is because we want to, you know, we're not looking for reproduction. In fact, you're trying. If you're being sexy, you're probably that's not what you want to be doing at all. And uh, yeah, reproductive sex. <sighs> <laughs> Oh man, it's a good thing we're all wearing masks, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, I guess the other thing that that is 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 sort of logically, I can't wrap my mind around it is that okay, here we have these two groups of gorillas, and maybe I don't know, maybe they're pretty far apart, maybe they're not as close as we think they are. Obviously, they have different habitats and even different diets, and I think there's more sexual dimorphism. I think among the mountain gorillas, I think they're even bigger. The males are bigger than the females. So, you know, there, there, there are some physical differences, even though they're members of the same species. But I mean, how to say, if it is evolutionarily beneficial 
for these male gorillas to hang out with kids. Why aren't the other gorillas doing it? You know what I mean? Like if it's giving me an evolutionary advantage, then what? Why couldn't somebody else figure that out? I don't know. Maybe I don't. I, like I said, there, there are many different things about this that, but the point, I guess my, the point is, I think of the article is that, you know, people, people, primates, non-human animals do a bunch of different things. We can't always come up with a causal reason why, uh, why they are doing that. And I guess I would go back to Leah's point that there's a cultural element to this, right? So in some ways, if you are in a society in which hanging out with, with infants as a male is going to pay off, then you might do that more, right? But if in your society that doesn't really pay off, then I mean, you know, you're not probably gonna start even if there might be some sort of so-called evolutionary advantage down the line. And I guess that leads me to this idea that, you know, the thing is, is that the words in science are often defined in a way that does not make sense to us as just regular old fashioned human beings, as just people on the street. And this happens a lot for those of you who've been with me in intro, it happens, or with others in intro, it happens with the idea of the theory of evolution. And so people are like, ah, the theory of evolution, that means evolution is just a theory. Well, as we know, or hopefully we know, in science, when you say the word theory, that means it's risen to the level of being hugely supported by all these different hypotheses. It's like, congratulating evolution. It's like saying it's up there with the theory of gravity or atomic theory. So oftentimes the ways that science uses these words is a lot different to us than what we sort of think about on the street. One example that it, what came up in our reading and we'll talk about it more today is the idea of fitness. Or, you know, when we talk about survival of the fittest and the idea of of fitness. When we think of fitness, what's our, what do you think of when you're thinking survival of the fittest and fitness? What image pops into your head? Yes. Exercise. Exercise. That's what I think of too. I think of a very, yeah, you think of somebody that's fit, right? Yeah, for sure. Well, the thing is, you don't have to copy this down, you can come on Wikipedia. When we talk about fitness in an evolutionary sense or what they call Darwinian fitness, all it means is you're going to reproduce more than other creatures. That is fitness. How much your genes got spread into the next generation. It has nothing to do with physical fitness as it is. So for example, if you have an Olympic athlete, the top of the top, the best of the best that does not reproduce for some reason, their evolutionary fitness is zero. They get a zero in fitness, right? Whereas if you have a couch potato who for some reason is a very reproductive person, they have a great evolutionary fitness. So, you know, like I said, this word is, uh, words like this get, get taken all out of context because we have a, a popular idea. It turns out that the biologists today, they don't really talk about survival of the fittest for this very reason, because evolutionary fitness does not mean uh, fitness in our sense of it. So they prefer again, the term, the term natural selection. And I was also struck by this, uh, even in this article, uh, they use the term evolutionary success. So for example, those, those male or the, the male gorillas that reproduce more if they hang out with kids or uh, Lee Gettler in that article talks about this is part of the evolutionary success of human beings. I mean, in this context, evolutionary success means being able to reproduce a lot, which is not 
necessarily what we think about in terms of success. I mean, I guess for some people it might be success, but for a lot of people that is not success. And again, the idea of having an evolutionary advantage, it only means that means you're reproducing more. Again, it's not giving you an advantage in like, you know, you might not even get good sex out of the deal. Let's put it that way. You might have an evolutionary advantage because you've had a lot of reproductive sex, but is that fun? Um, anyway, so those words are very different. Oh, by the way, what is the most evolutionarily successful creature in the world today? The most evolutionarily successful creature organism. I've opened up a trick question, I guess. People are scared. You know, throw some things out there. Let's see what we got. Leah, what do you got? No clue. Insects. Insects are definitely up there. There's a lot of them. They are they're doing well. A lot of people back when I was a kid and we thought about dying in a nuclear holocaust, they'd be like, and then the insects will be there still. So yeah, they're they're pretty cool. The insects, they're doing well, probably better than better than us. Yeah. Jonathan, what do you got? Frogs. Frogs. Oh no, the frogs, the frogs. Eh. Are they doing well? I feel like they're, are they? Are you seeing frogs around? I feel like they're under. I think the poor frogs are, you know. Several frogs in the backyard. You see a lot of frogs. Yeah, they might be, they might be having some evolutionary success based on your, uh, your geography. I feel like I saw one in my backyard and I thought, man, they are spreading because I live on Elm Street, so. You know, they do seem to be getting around, but uh, yeah. All right. Rats. I was thinking about rats and mice, you know, they seem to be, the mice, they seem to be doing well. They were overrunning Australia recently. I don't know if they ever cleaned those mice up. There seem to be a lot more of them. I think they might, they might win. Yeah. Rabbits. Rabbits. <laughs> Ah, yes, well, the reproducing rabbits, the, 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 they are really, yeah, the rabbits, they might be winning too. Uh, yeah, no, all those are good answers, but think smaller. There is actually a correct answer. Yes, Gabe. Bacteria. Bacteria. Bacteria are the clear winners. The single-celled organism are the, the most evolutionarily successful creature they will be here even after the insects. They've transformed the world. And you do know that there are more bacteria cells living in, on, and around our body than we have actual human cells. You know that? So like we need these bacteria in our guts to do our digestion. We, they're all over the place. So we actually are carriers. As we walk around, we're just kind of carrying more bacteria than we are. We couldn't live without them. Some of them we can, but all right. <laughs> bacteria, yay. All right, so returning to the article, this is Rebecca Sear, the last part of this. The key defining feature of our species is our behavioral flexibility. Assuming that certain roles are natural for fathers or mothers can make parents feel isolated and stressed. So again, this turns us back to one of, I hope is the key points, right, of anthropology is to take a look at the world in a non-deterministic way and to look empirically around the world and be like, hey, wait a second. There's a lot of behavioral flexibility. There's been more among the non-human primates like gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, etc. There's been more flexibility among them than people have realized for a long time. But that's just even gets ramped up in terms of uh, in terms of the behavioral flexibility of uh, 
of human beings. And so, you know, what she's, uh, Rebecca Sear is saying here is that, you know, the, our, our notion of, of the nuclear family in which we used to believe that fathering couldn't occur without these sort of monogamous nuclear families and the father goes off and provisions all the time. And that's kind of, I mean, it's not that it's rare. There's a lot of places where that happens, but there's a lot of places where they do other things as well. And so then she ends, or the, the author ends the article again with a quote from Sear. I think we need to take a much more non judgmental view of the human family. A non judgmental view of the human family. How's that going to work? What do you think? Are we going to be able to do this? <laughs> Why? We can take a non-judgmental view of the human family, can't we, Ari? No, because it's learned. <laughs> no, because it's learned. <laughs> yeah, I guess my, my, my note on this was good luck with that one. You know, people get really judgmental about human families. They love judging the human families. They love doing that. So I hope so. I mean, yes, we learn it, but you know, anthropology says we can learn things and unlearn things and learn to have a non-judgmental view, but whew, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a doozy out there. I mean, well, let's be optimistic. We've been we've we've evolved our views about the kinds of people who can get married to each other and those kinds of things. Maybe we can do this too. Non-judgmental view of the human family. All right. So mountain gorillas, yay, fathers of all. All right, let's go into Darwin. So heading into Darwin and, and uh, the article, the, uh, the editorial that, uh, that Fuentes wrote. I wanna start here with uh, Darwin's, really his truly magnificent work on the origin of species by means of natural selection. That's where the finches come in. Um, this book is, you know, I mean, I, I, this is an, a, a truly incredible book. It was written in, it was published in 1859, and it really did, it, it, it still does stand as, as a classic, in part because, you know, Darwin's meticulous observations of the natural world and the way in which he was working through some of these problems. And you know what's interesting, one of the things that's interesting about this book is, as I said at the beginning, Darwin didn't really use the term evolution. He, he preferred the term descent with modification. And we often think of this, that this book is about evolution and it is, but Darwin actually only used the word evolution. This book is huge, by the way, it's a very long book. He only used the, the word evolution in this book two times and they are on the very last page. And so he's working through all this stuff, but it's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's certainly not what we might consider a, a tome about evolution. And there's one, there's a, there's a particular phrase in, that in 1859 and in the original publication of the book that people, uh, there's, there's one phrase in there that definitely does not occur. So not only does he not use the phrase evolution very much, he uses it a couple times, Sean, what's the big phrase here that we always hear about evolution, but Darwin didn't even use back then? Huh, I thought you wrote about it. What do you think about when you think about evolution? What's the first thing that came to mind at least two classes ago? Like there's just some changes you need in order to continue on. And that means survival of the fittest. Yeah. Sure. That's another phrase that Darwin did not use in this book, never used it. The first person to invent, or the first person to use survival of the fittest, as I told you in the last class, was Herbert Spencer. He was a sociologist. He was on Wikipedia too, so you don't have to copy it all around. So Spencer read Darwin's book and he said, hey, that's what I was thinking. And so he said, this survival of the fittest is that which Mr. Darwin has called natural selection. So it was Spencer who said natural selection is the same thing as 
survival of the fittest. Now, it is true that Darwin then liked that idea. He's like, yeah, good idea, survival of the fittest. And he started to use it. And he especially started to use it uh, in, he, he put it back into later editions of this book and he used it in the book, Descent of Man. I wanna focus here, I hadn't actually looked at this before, but look at the last part of Herbert Spencer's thing. He says, Mr. Darwin has called natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, which I first wanna say that I don't think Spencer is using the term favored races to refer to uh, human races. He's using the term much more broadly. He's saying favored races in terms of animal and plant species because that's what Darwin was talking about. But, you know, the thing is, it's there though. I mean, it's not like people didn't think about human races at the time. And it's not like people didn't almost, you know, didn't not too long after this, take up this idea of fittest traits and how they were, they might be racially organized and how we might want to breed out or breed in good and bad traits. And those things that led to the ideas of eugenics and how eugenics might be supported by evolution. And it was just, it was just curious to me that there it is. And I told you, whenever we're thinking about these big ideas, natural selection, survival of the fittest, race is always going to be around. And there it is from the very beginning. It's kind of spooky, right? It's like, you know, the first time that Spencer uses the survival of the fittest, where he links it to race. Now, again, I don't think he was talking here about human races, but you wouldn't be, it wouldn't take you long to get there. Right? You wouldn't, it wouldn't be hard to get from here to there. So that was eight, but that was 1859. Then Herbert Spencer uh, put this out in 1864. And by 1871, we then have the descent of man. And that's where he starts talking about sexual selection, puts in the survival of the fittest, and comes out with a book that is, uh, well, it's, uh, we talked about the race stuff a little bit. What else, Michelle? What else is in there besides just the race stuff? Wait, is Michelle back there? Michelle, what? yeah, you were actually this, you were thinking about this personally. It wasn't just a racist text, it's also, Yeah, men are more capable than women and, and you know, and they always will be because they're, blah, blah, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's also a, a kind of a, a it's also a, a, a sexist text as well. Uh, and so not very, not very good stuff from Darwin, really. I mean, there's some insights in it, but not, not our best. Now, uh, so on, you know, this year is, 150 years since the publication of The Descent of Man. Augustine Fuentes wrote this short editorial in Science in which he basically spelled these things out. Um, I don't think this is, a, this is actually, Fuentes' position is, is probably not very controversial in anthropology. We kind of all knew this about Darwin. Um, it's, it didn't seem very controversial to you. I mean, you hadn't perhaps seen it before, but most of you are like, oh, yeah, sure. Um, and so uh, it was odd, I guess maybe, it is possible that Fuentes himself was surprised by the backlash that he got to this. And it led to sort of a series of tweets. And I mean, I, I don't wanna take it too far, which I think some of you wanted to do like, Fuentes was very clear that Darwin is, is a, is a, was a great thinker. He was an amazing thinker and, and that, that Darwin is one of Fuentes' heroes and he's not trying to bring our modern sensibilities and, say, and condemn Darwin for that. He's trying to look at him in the context of that time and say, well, okay, yes, these ideas obviously 
uh, were more influential than what he should have been able to do as a perceiver, as a human being, and as a scientist. But yeah, there was this huge backlash and hate mail and all these people got mad. And so I asked you, uh, why, why the backlash? Ari, actually, you said it might be because, did you mean that Augustine Fuentes is not a white guy? Yeah. Ah, huh? Yeah, I know. Yeah, kind of. He's got that funny name, Fuentes. I, I only said that because my son Monte went there. Uh-huh. So I was like, oh. Yeah, it's funny. I was trying to figure out if, you know, he's, he, he's you know, we, we haven't, that's one of those things about race in this country. We haven't figured out these, these new people who are on the edge. Fuentes, interestingly, is of, uh, he's, he's actually, a, He's pretty Spaniard Spanish. And so, yeah, he's like, I don't know. And for those of you who've been in Spaniard Spanish white whiteness, it's pretty intense too. I don't know what he would say, but uh, his, his name doesn't sound like some of those other guys that were, you know, criticizing him. So it's possible, you know, I mean, I have to wonder what it would have happened if he looked, you know, he looked even differenter than he does there, but yeah, it's uh, that's possible. So the backlash, Willa, why do you think the backlash is, or what? What do you think is going on there? What are people scared of? Yeah, that if we if we criticize Darwin, then people will just be like, ah. Oh, Aha, I knew it, creationism. And so, yeah, I mean, which is kind of absurd. Uh, I was actually looking, when I was looking for tweets on Fuentes' timeline, he tweeted out this too, which was really interesting to me. Um, it turns out that over the last year, um, basically, they're used to, basically people accept evolution more than ever before. And that's now become like it used to be that that their that creationism was a a bigger deal, and so this article states that you know this is kind of a a, a quiet victory because you know there there isn't so much creationism going on, and it probably hasn't. I mean that that victory didn't occur because we made Darwin into a hero. I also think here that you know I think that people might. There's been this whole, I think especially, you've probably heard this in the last, especially in the last couple of years, all these people banging on the table and saying, follow the science, the science, the science. And, you know, I'm a good follow the science person, but I also think we have to realize that like science is done in a human way. And there's, you know, there's different ways to do science. So, Again, the end part of, uh, of Fuentes. In the end, learning from dissent illuminates the highest and most interesting problem for human evolutionary studies today, moving toward an evolutionary science of humans instead of man, scent of man. So I'm going to turn this on its head a little bit. Usually when people write something critical of Darwin and then he got the backlash, like you're going to, you're going to ruin science, you're going to ruin evolution. Let me put it to you this way. How might, if we accept Fuente's premise, how might that make science better? How might that make evolution better? You know what I mean? Why might it be good to know for us to know this? Instead of bad. Yeah, John. And we can acknowledge the mistakes of the past and be able to learn from them rather than Acknowledge the mistakes of the past and be able to learn from them rather than pretending they never existed. That sounds smart to me. That sounds like only something people should do in their lives. And the other way seems dumb, right? They're not, 
we don't teach people to do that. That seems like a dumb idea, right? So yes, acknowledge the mistakes of the past. How that, how might that make science better? In addition to the mistakes of the past, I agree with you, but what else might happen over there in Johnstone? So we might take in a more human content and more human approach to science and we might recognize that you know we do science and so we should be able to figure it out let me put it to you this way if you were a person who was say uh you know descended from one of the populations that uh darwin was ripping on and the descent of man how might that make you feel about being in the uh biology department. I guess what I'm trying to say is it might help us get better scientists, right? Bring more people in, be more inclusive about, you know, the kinds of people we can welcome into the scientific community, right? So, um, you know, uh, I think that by doing this, we can acknowledge our mistakes, make science more human and make it, make it more inclusive, right? We can do, we, this can hopefully help us do better science, not, not ruin science. Gabe asks, who should be the new figurehead? If we don't put Darwin on the pedestal, who should we put there? Yeah, Gabe, okay. what do you think? I mean, there doesn't have to be one. I was just asking if like, we had to replace Darwin with somebody new. <laughs> yeah, if we had to replace Darwin with somebody, who would it be? Um, for some reason, I just, when, when, when I was thinking about that question, that song from uh, Tina Turner, We Don't Need Another Hero, kept echoing in my mind because I agree with you. Like, you know, pedestals and statues and singular you know portraying history as a succession of of successful individuals maybe we don't need that maybe we need something else there are some people in fuente's piece i don't know if you noticed that i did want to hear more about because i had never heard of them before he talks about in darwin's own life he learned from an african descendant south american naturalist john edmundstone in edinburgh i think that's how you pronounce that and was you know had was interacted with the fuegians and his own daughter was a key editor for uh his uh for uh for the origin of species i want to know about all the people who made this possible right Whenever you put somebody on a statue, there's probably a whole bunch of people who were making this possible. So I would really love to hear about John Edmund Stone, an African descendant South American naturalist. I would love to hear about the people who were guiding Darwin when he was looking at the finches. Like he didn't just show up at the Galapagos and like truck out there and be like finches and collect. I mean, people had to help out. He had to talk to people. And a lot of times, whenever you look at someone who's sort of put on a pedestal, there's a lot of things that have been uh, contributed to that. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not into tearing down to, for the sake of tearing down or statues coming down for the sake of them coming down, but we need a richer view of, uh, of human history. 